Good morning. If you would please remain standing. If uh, you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Psalm 110 this morning, uh, Psalm 110. Uh, If you do not have a Bible, there are Bibles over by the connection table uh, where you came in. Uh, You can grab one of those, and uh, we would love for you to keep that, uh, our gift to you, if you do not have a Bible. This morning, like I said, we will be reading from Psalm 110, and it says this, A Psalm of David, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. This concludes the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Lord, we thank you for just the opportunity that we have to gather together as a body of believers to celebrate who you are and to lift you high. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, go before Pastor Brandon, give him the words to speak this morning, uh, and that you would just uh, work in our hearts and minds uh, so that we would be ready to hear your word and apply it to our lives. Lord, we love you. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. morning church there it is what happens when you don't turn your mic pack on that's that's on me we are very glad that you're here with us today Uh, we're very glad that we can be outside enjoying this beautiful weather it's it's a little warm but it's okay Uh, we'll, we'll definitely be longing for this come December so just think of that if you feel like it's too warm but it is, uh, it is a great month coming up here at Mill Creek Community Church. We want to just, uh, oh, is that me? There it is. We want to just make you aware of a couple different things that are going to be uh, happening in this next month that are going to be very important for us as a church. Uh, the first thing I want to make mention of is on August 11th, which is a Sunday, uh, in the evening from 6.30 to 7.30, we're going to have a members meeting. So If you are a covenant member of Mill Creek Community Church, we're inviting you out to that members meeting. It'll be in our sanctuary. We promise it won't be outside. Uh, But on August 11th, we're going to be talking about the business of the church. That's the the benefit of being uh, a covenant member of our church is that uh, you are are privy to to what we're doing, uh, to to how we're doing it, to, to where we're going, to the vision, to the direction all of those things, uh, and our, our substance of that meeting time will really center around our vision and our strategy for missions moving forward. We want to cast some vision of what God is already doing in our missions program, uh, where we're headed, and some different things to update you on in our missions program. So uh, we encourage you to come and be a part of that. Uh, we invite your children to come with you. It's important for kids to see a church and a healthy church operating and ministering and doing business together. So your kids are invited to come be a part of that. They're not going to be disruptive or bother us at all. We're a family. Uh, It's a family meeting. So we invite you to be a part of that uh, as a covenant member of our church. If you'd like to become a covenant member of our church, um, In the fall here, as we head back inside, we're going to be offering membership classes where you can learn more, kind of peel back the curtain here at MCC, learn a little bit about what we do, why we do it, and and how we operate as a church. And that's a great way for you to just go deeper in uh, in what we do here as a church, uh, as a covenant member. So we invite you to that as well. And then in September, September 20th and 21st, Uh, A massive event is coming here to Erie. So uh, we are a part of the Southern Baptist Network. uh, And and with that, our our local network of Pennsylvania and South Jersey is called the Baptist Resource Network. And they're coming to Erie to serve in our community and in our city. 
So they reached out to uh, myself, Walnut Creek, uh, and then also Harbor Creek Community Church, and, and they, they want to partner with us to do ministry here in Erie. So they, they've opened up this service opportunity to uh, all of Pennsylvania and South Jersey. There's churches coming from all the way down close to Maryland. They're going to be coming up into Erie to serve in our community and in our city, and we want to partner with them as they do that uh, as, a, as a church where we can network with other churches that are all across our great state. Uh, so on September 20th and 21st, there's going to be a couple opportunities for you to serve. Uh, on the 20th, it's all going to be local service opportunities right here in Mill Creek. So uh, Mill Creek Community Church is going to be a hub church where we go into Grover, Cleveland. We serve by renovating their playground, renovating their teacher's lounge, loving on our school and our community and doing ministry, uh, making an impact in our community. And then also here on that day on September 20th, we're going to be building foster care beds for, uh, for the Keystone Family Alliance uh, to help uh, facilitate foster children getting into homes. A uh, big deal for them is to have beds. So we're going to be building beds. Uh, there's going to be opportunities through Harbor Creek and also through Walnut Creek. So uh, to look at those opportunities. And then on the 21st, which is Saturday, uh, the hub of ministry is going to be the mission. So the Erie City Mission is, is a staple uh, in our church. We have many people that, that serve uh, in leadership opportunities there, uh, and they're, they're all involved th through there. We have a great uh, connection with the Erie City Mission, uh, and we're going to be serving by doing a block party and doing uh, ministry to the homeless. There's going to be all different kinds of ways to serve. So if you're interested in any of that on either of those days, the Friday or the Saturday, uh, in your worship guide, there's a, there's a link that you can sign up at. Uh, they're encouraged you to sign up because they're going to provide meals. Uh, I think they're going to give you a t-shirt, so that's a real good reason to sign up right there. Get a free t-shirt. Um, if you start coming to Mill Creek Community Church, we will just dedicate a whole roar, draw, drawer to t-shirts because you'll end up getting them through serving here. But it's a, it's a great opportunity for you to serve and just be a part of what we're doing here as well. So sign up in that uh, and, and take advantage of it. So we are back in our summer in the Psalms. Last week we, we took a, a little uh, excursion away from the Psalms to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And the reason why we did that is we closed out our, our VBS, and that was the theme uh, verse for our VBS. We wanted to just highlight that as well. And uh, we had a ton of visitors from Vacation Bible School. Maybe you're back here and this is your second week with us because you came last week and we welcome you here. Uh, fill out a connection card. We want to have a record of your visit. We want to follow through and just love you well as a family here at Mill Creek Community Church. But we're back in our summer in the Psalms. And as we get back into that, uh, I want to just remind you that, that as we go back into inside in September here, we're going to be starting a new series in the fall called, um, uh, it's going to be called Paul's Prayers for the Church. And as we, as we look at Paul's Prayers for the Church, our goal in that series is to, to examine how Paul prayed in the New Testament for the churches that he ministered to and that, that ministered to him. And as we examine our, our theme of prayer through the whole entire year, we're going to look specifically at how we should be praying for our church and other churches in the area. So we're going to have specific opportunities uh, through a prayer activity to pray for local missions. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity each and every week that we come together to pray for our church and then other churches in the area that are doing gospel ministry. So it's going to be a great time studying Paul's prayers for the church. But we hope that you'll come back for that amazing series as we join back into the, the inside services, into two services in September. But we are today in Psalm 110. So uh, if you have your Bible still there, leave them open on Psalm 110. And as we look at our summer in the Psalms, we're looking at the different types of Psalms that exist all throughout the 150 Psalms. So we've looked at lament Psalms, we've looked at praise Psalms. And, and now we're looking at the royal psalms, the psalms that, that talk of a coming king, that, that talk about a king who will rule and reign. And as we said two weeks ago, as we looked at the, the, the royal psalm in Psalm chapter 2, we said it's an opportune time in our election cycle to be looking at who is actually ruling and reigning on the earth and to be reminded of that as Christians. But today, as we look at the royal psalm of Psalm 110, I want to give you a little bit of context on the psalm before we dive in and, and, and exegete what, what David is writing to us here in this psalm. And, and to be honest, there's not a more important psalm in this book to help us understand the New Testament than this psalm. This is the key 
for us understanding the New Testament scriptures is this psalm because this psalm is quoted more than any other Old Testament passage in the New Testament. This passage is. This psalm is. The, the apostles and even Jesus himself cite this psalm more than any other Old Testament passage. So that being said, for us understanding the New Testament, we need to understand what is being said in the Old Testament. This passage has become kind of the gold standard for understanding the teaching that we find in the New Testament. So given its heavy citation in the New Testament, it's important for us to understand what it's saying here and what it's saying to us that we can understand for our world today as well. So the best interpretive clue that we're given in the psalm, the best interpretive clue that that just kind of prefaces the whole entire psalm is found in the subscript of this psalm. So so many of us, we look at the the heading, and in some of your Bibles, if you have an ESV, it says, sit at my right hand might be the heading of the psalm. It says Psalm 110. And then we skip those words that are in italics. We skip those because we're like, well, if it's in italics, I don't have to read it. But, but if we do that, we actually miss the most important interpretive element of this psalm. And it's this, that it's a psalm of David. It's a psalm of David. This is a, an important understanding for us in understanding the context. Most of the time, those subscripts in the psalms tell us who the author is and, and the literary or musical form that accompanies the psalm. And for a lot of us, we don't understand what it's saying, but this is a very simple, straightforward subscript that says, this is a psalm of David. And understanding that is going to help us understand the most important aspect of the psalm. It's not a ton of information for us to go on. It doesn't tell us when in David's life he was writing us. It doesn't tell us how old he was. It doesn't tell us many of the key things about David. It just says this was a psalm of David. So there's not much for us to go on, but it is important information nonetheless. David's recording here in Psalm 110 a conversation that he was privy to that was happening in the heavens, a, a conversation that he was, he was allowed to overhear that is a very important conversation. So let's look at verse 1 and see the substance and the, the key players in this conversation that David was listening to. Psalm 110 verse 1 says this, The Lord says to my Lord, the key players here are the Lord and the Lord, if we read it in the, Old, in the, the New Testament or, or the, the, the English that we have. But if we were to read it in the Hebrew text, it would say this, the Lord Yahweh says to my Lord Adonai. So if we look at it, we're like, the Lord says to my Lord, and it's like, well, is there like a multi-personality disorder going on here? Is he talking to himself like the Lord is talking to the Lord? Like, that doesn't make sense. But in the, the original Hebrew language, we see that there's, there's two distinct elements to God here. There's two distinct elements that, that Yahweh is talking to David's Adonai. This term Adonai is a, an important name for God. It's, a, it's referring to a king or a ruler, and King David is telling us that there is going to be a stronger and a better king coming. The king himself is telling us that there will be a better king that is coming. So let's examine that king today in Psalm 110. Let's look first at our first point, which is this, the king. The king is described for us in verses 1 and 2. It says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. See, our first question to ask is this, who is this king? Who is this king or this Adonai that David is referring to here in the psalm? See, in order for us to to understand and to learn who this king is, we must observe some things about the king that's described here in the text. So here's a couple observations of the king. The first observation is this. The king is greater than David. David says, this is my Lord. The, the, The king of Israel saying that I have a Lord that is above me. And David says that that this Lord, this Adonai, is is his personal Lord, his leader, meaning that this person is above and beyond his rule and his authority. If we understand Israel's monarchy and understand how it operated in the Old Testament, what we understand is that this is absolutely impossible, that the king of Israel was the highest authority in the land. The only person higher than the authority of the king was God himself because that's who he reported to directly. The the king of Israel was only reporting to God Almighty. 
See, Israel was God's chosen people, and God's king was his instrument to lead his people. So for David to say that there is a Lord that is above him does not make sense because he was the highest authority in the land. There could not be a king that was greater than or above David. We see that that, that David was also, not only was he the king, but he was the best king that Israel had ever seen. He was the king over the glory years of Israel. All of the good things that happened in Israel happened under David's rule. David expanded the border. They they had the biggest territory that they ever had. They had military peace because he went and conquered the lands that were around him. David brought all of the glory years to Israel. So when David says, hey, there's a king who is better than me, people would be like, yeah, right. Look at all the things that you did. You are the greatest king that has ever ruled. David's saying that that this Adonai is going to be greater than him. He's going to be the best ever. Or to put it in more modern slang, he's going to be the goat, right? Older people are like, why are you talking about goats? The greatest of all time, the goat. That's the acronym for that. He says that, that this king is going to be greater than David. The second thing that we observe here in this text is this, is that this king will actually be God himself. This king is greater than David, and that makes sense with our second observation, which is this king will be God. So Yahweh establishes his king, and he says here in verse 1, the the second line, he says, sit at my right hand. He says, sit at my right hand. It's an important designation because the right hand was the the hand of power. The, The right hand or sitting at the right hand was the seat of power. So the power of this Adonai is going to be the same power that Yahweh exists in, the God who created everything. The covenant God of Israel is going to have a king who operates in the same power that he does. You see, to sit at the right hand meant that you were equal or level with God. To sit at the right hand of a king meant that you were equal or level with the king. So to sit at the right hand of God was the same designation. You're equal and level with God. See, that we understand through this time period of history, and if we read anything about history, we understand that there's many rulers who claimed themselves to be divine. Many rulers who claimed that they were God themselves. People like Xerxes and Pharaoh and Caesar and Nebuchadnezzar. People were like, worship me because I am a God. I I rule over this world, and I am the, the Lord of this world. And as much as they claimed that, their lives couldn't back it up. But this king will be different. This king will be special because he will actually be God. He, he won't just claim to be God. He'll have, he'll have the designation, but he'll also have the power of God that goes with him. So David learns that this great king and to follow him will be like following God himself. The third observation that we see here in this passage is found in verse 2. It's that this king will rule and he will reign. He won't just be a king in designation only, but he will be a ruling and reigning king. Look at the imagery of this divine king. Verse 2 says, The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. The scepter was a key accessory to any king who was going to rule and reign. They would have a scepter. It was the scepter of their power. It was a physical representation of the power that they wielded. The scepter was that instrument of power, and that power is given to this Adonai. This this power is given to the Adonai from Yahweh himself. God is giving this king all of his power. Verse 3 says, or verse verse 2 says at the end of it, that that he will rule in the midst of your enemies. That this king is is going to rule his enemies. That that, that he's going to, to, to be victorious as a king. It's not going to say he's going to, he's going to fight very valiantly and maybe, maybe he'll try to rule his enemies. No, it's a definitive statement. He will rule over his enemies. He'll be victorious. He's not a loser. He's a winner. He's, he's not a coward. He's strong in victory. This king is ruling and reigning over the people that would oppose him. He's unstoppable. That's an important thing for us to to see here, that this king is a conquering and ruling king. But then then an even more definitive statement here is found at the end of verse 1. It says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. 
the, the portrait of making them a footstool was this, was literally it meant that the king would step on the throat of his enemies. That's the picture of making your enemies your footstool, that you were stepping on their throats. It was a sign of absolute control and power. The kings in this day and age, as they de- defeated or vanquished a foe, they would step on their necks as a sign that they were over them that they had defeated them, that they had conquered them, that they were victorious. So all of the language of this king is that he will rule and reign not in defeat, but in victory. He's a victorious king. And this king that David mentions will be a powerful king. He'll have the power of God behind him and he will be ruling and reigning. And the fact that this great king that David is painting for us here, he's painting this picture of this great king coming to Israel, no doubt the people of Israel would have been excited and wondered, who is this great king? He's going to be better than David? That's pretty great. Who is he? Who is this king that's going to save us? Who is this king that's going to vanquish his foes? It's, it's like every sports fan on draft day, right? They, they eagerly wait, who are, who's going to be the person that saves our franchise? This 18-year-old kid or 20-year-old kid or whatever, this is going to be the savior of our franchise. And they eagerly wait for the name to come so they can put all their hope and trust in somebody who's wearing a black and gold uniform on Sunday. And that's, my, that's my hope and trust is that that name will be the one who saves our franchise. Sorry, Steeler fans, it's not going to happen. But the idea is that that, that is what Israel's doing. They're, they're longing to know who this king is. And if we're honest, hopefully we've built a little bit of tension in the message. We want to know who this king is. Who is this king? Is there any evidence to who it may be? And the answer is yes. That, that the original Jewish audience, as they would have understood this psalm, they would have said, this king is going to be the one that we call Messiah. He's going to be the king who is the savior, the anointed one, God himself dwelling with us, ruling and reigning over all. They understood the Messiah as one who is going to rule and reign over all of Israel. But because we possess the whole Bible, we read the Bible backwards because we know how it ends. We know who the Messiah ultimately fulfilled is, and it's Jesus. Jesus is the king that David is talking about. David didn't know his name. He just knew that he was going to be the Messiah king. He knew that he was going to be God himself, the one promised to him in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that would rule on his throne forever and ever. David knew that it was going to be that person, but in the New Testament, we find out that that person is Jesus. Jesus is the king who will vanquish his foes. Jesus is the king who carries the scepter of God the Father as he rules and he reigns. That's why this is a royal psalm, because it centers on Jesus' kingly rule. And the beauty is, his rule isn't just for Israel, because the New Testament tells us that his rule is over all of the earth. That we don't have to exist as national Jews in order to be under the kingly rule of Jesus like they did under the kingly rule of David. No, Jesus' rule is universal over the earth. It's for the Gentiles too. That's the beauty of the New Testament is that we are incorporated into God's kingdom. The New Testament confirms here that Jesus is the substance of David's message. See, Peter confirms that. In, in the greatest message that Peter ever preached in Acts chapter 2, Jesus just ascended into heaven. The day of Pentecost comes. Peter is preaching his pants off. That's a, that's a term in the, the pastor community. Preach your pants off, right? That's what he's doing. And this is the guy who just, who just rebuked and, 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 and didn't confess Jesus. And now he's confessing him in front of all of the crowds. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. The Holy Spirit showed up in Acts chapter 2. And as he preaches, this is what he preaches. Acts chapter 2, verse 34 through 36. Peter says, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, and he quotes Psalm 110, he says this, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Peter goes on to say, Let all the house of Israel Therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Peter says that the the person that David was talking about, the Adonai that was foreshadowed in Psalm 110, it was Jesus and you crucified him. He's preaching to the Jews. 
Well, if we look at that, well, then it's kind of problematic for us to say, well, David is calling his offspring, his great, great, great grandchild, his Lord. That doesn't make sense. If we know anything about respect and seniority, generationally speaking, you can't call somebody who's younger than you and comes after you as greater than you. That just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in our world today, and it definitely didn't make sense in their day. But that logic... That logic that, that Jesus as the descendant of David wouldn't work if Jesus was just a man. But what we know to be true about Jesus is that he was the God-man. So the, the explanation for how Jesus as a descendant of David could be David's Lord is because the incarnation, because, because Jesus was the God-man. He was fully God and fully man dwelling here on earth with us. It's the only explanation for how David's offspring could be greater than him. David's offspring could be also his Lord. But Jesus isn't just the king of Israel, but as we said, he's, he's also our king. Well, the question then is, what did that mean for Israel? What does that mean for us that, that he's king over all? Well, look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, that as, as king, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. The response to Jesus as king over all, as king over the universe, the response is this, is that his people, his followers, the ones who love him and submit to his authority will offer themselves freely. Now, the idea here in that statement is that Jesus' followers will make themselves a free will offering to him. They'll offer themselves freely to Jesus as their authority. It's kind of reminiscent, if you let me nerd out for a second here. If you like the Lord of the Rings, the first movie, The Fellowship of the Ring, they're deciding, what do we do with this ring? We've got to destroy it. It's a bad thing. And there's this scene where they're all sitting in a circle around the ring, and they're arguing, what are we going to do? I'll take it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. They're all saying that they're going to be the one to destroy it. And they're like, well, you shouldn't because you're just going to use it, or you shouldn't because you're an elf. Okay? Just roll with me, all right? And then all of a sudden... This little hobbit walks up and he says, I'll take the ring to Mordor. It's Frodo, right? Spoiler alert, he takes the ring to Mordor, okay? And, and he says, I'm going to take the ring to Mordor. And, and, and as he does that, they all stop and they get quiet and they look at him. And all of a sudden, all of the members of the fellowship look at him and they say, well, then I'm going with you. I pledge myself to you, Frodo. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with you. And it wasn't compulsory that they had to go with him. They could have been like, good luck, little dude. Hopefully you do it. But instead they say, if you're going to do this, we will follow you, not as a compulsory thing, but as a free will offering of ourselves. And many of those people in that movie gave their lives for him. And that's the idea here is this, is that when we offer ourselves freely to God, we're declaring, we're going to follow you. Your cause is our cause. Your goal is our goal. You are the one who's going to lead us. And the offering here portrays our submission to Jesus as Lord over everything. That's what it says here. Your people, your people offer themselves freely as a submission to God, to Jesus as God. It's a submission to him as Lord over all. The people who offer themselves freely are people who grasp fully that Jesus is Lord over all. They grasp that his power is God's power, and they respond appropriately in offering themselves fully to him. They don't see Jesus as a good teacher. They don't see Jesus as a good man. They don't see Jesus as an angel or just a really good speaker or a moral person or a philosopher. No, they see Jesus as God and Lord over everything, and that's why they submit themselves fully to him. I think... In our own lives, we can be guilty of making Jesus less than Lord in our lives. For many of us, we just want Jesus to be our friend, and, and he does describe himself in words of friendship towards us, but ultimately we need to remember that he is Lord of our lives. Walter Chantry says it this way in his commentary. He says, Jesus is your Lord. You are his and he is yours. However, you are not pals. He is Lord and Master, and you are servant and disciple. He is infinitely above you. 
His throne holds sway over your present life. A king is to be honored, confessed, obeyed, and worshipped. We would do well to remind ourselves that if we have boldly declared that Jesus is Lord of our lives, he is not just a friend that we walk with, but he is a Lord who is guiding us. That everything that he says in this book is good for our lives and should be something that we obey. And we follow, we confess, we honor, and we worship. See, if we're not careful, we miss Jesus by overemphasizing him as, well, he's just a, he's my buddy. Jesus is my buddy and my pal. You see, as a friend, he's somebody who would walk with you. But as Lord, he leads us. As a friend, he would be there to talk and discuss your problems. But as Lord, he gives you commands that you obey and you follow with all of your being and every fiber of who you are. I think there's many of us that hear this preaching today and we say, well, well, that's me. I'm willing to do anything for Jesus. I'm a free will offering for, for whatever Jesus would command and say and do. And, and we, we boldly say that. But the question I have is, are we actually living that out? See, if we're honest, I think we talk a really good game. Yeah, I'm fully surrendered to Jesus, but are we really willing to do what he asks us? Jesus is ruling and reigning in our hearts now, then, then as our king, he's commanded things of us, and are we willingly submitted to his kingship as Christians? And some of us may still say, yes, yeah, I, I am. Well, let me give you a specific example of where I hear the most excuses as a pastor, and even sometimes I wrestle with obeying the Lord. See, people can obey the Lord and his commands, but sometimes we wrestle in this area, specifically Matthew chapter 28. Many of you know the command that happens there. Matthew 28, verse 18, before Jesus gives us the greatest commission that he could ever give us, he says this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Reminiscent here of Psalm 110. He says, the authority that I hold over you and over heaven and over the earth has been given to me. I am the king. I'm the Messiah. I'm the ruling and reigning Adonai from Psalm 110. He prefaces his greatest commission by saying, I have the legal right to command this of you as your king. And this is what he says in verse 19. Go and make disciples. The the command that he gives us is this. I am your king, and this is a direct command from the king. Go and make disciples. Church, if that's a command from the king that we willingly submit our lives to, then why are our discipleship groups the hardest groups to staff? Why is it that it's hard for us to find people who will lead a discipleship group? Why is it hard for us to to share our faith? We, we, We make excuses as to why we can't preach the gospel or why we can't commit to being disciples or discipling other people. I got too much on my plate. If I say something, I'll be canceled. Or, or I don't know the words to say. I'm, not, I'm just not good with people. No, no, if you believe that Jesus is Lord, if he's the king of Psalm 110 that commands uh, uh, authority over all of heaven and earth, well, then he's commanded you to do this. Go and make disciples. It's not an option, people. We must go and we must preach. We must go and we must teach. We must go and we must disciple. And, and if Jesus has all that authority and you believe that, then the question is, are you willing to obey it? If Jesus is your king, then he commands all of your life. He's not just your buddy and your pal, he's Lord. And David reminds us of that. But then he also introduces another key aspect of the king here. Jump down to verse 4, the next verse in our study here. It says this, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God makes a divine oath with himself. It says the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind that he's going to establish Jesus as a priest. That's no small statement to make. That, that, that God is swearing by himself. And as he swears by himself, he doesn't do it flippantly, but he puts all of his, his, his uh, nature as God on the line because if God does not do what he says, then he is not God. His reputation is at stake. To put it in poker terms, he's all in on the statement of making Jesus the priest. It's going to happen. And if it doesn't, then all of this is for naught. 
and this book is a lie. But he does. He makes Jesus the priest. Jesus is a king, but he's also a priest. And if I'm being honest with you today, that doesn't nearly shock us as much as it would have shocked the Jews that were reading this. See, the Jews that were reading this would have been like, wait, 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 wait. He can't be king and priest. You get one or the other. He can't be both. That's not the way it works, David. Do you miss the understanding that there's a separation between the kings and the priests? You see, to a Jew reading this, kings were not priests and priests were not kings. And that was spelled out for them in the Levitical law. If we read all the way back in the first five books of the Bible, it spells out that kings can't be priests and priests can't be kings. They were separate from one another. They had different rules, different qualifications. They can't be the same person. See, priests represented, represented people before the God that they served. Priests were the one who, who took the sacrifice to make atonement for their sins so that people could live in a right relationship with God. They were restoring that relationship. But then kings were the ones who were leading the people. They represented God to the people. On earth, the kings were like God because they were leading the people. They were two different and distinct people, two different duties that they had. The roles were unique and different from one another. And in the Levitical law, those roles were never to overlap. In fact, if the role of king and priest overlapped, it was a sin. And the only time that we see that happening in the Old Testament was with King Saul, the predecessor to King David. King Saul goes out into battle and he, he knows that he should offer the sacrifices and that should happen through the, the high priest and through the prophet Samuel. And he's waiting for Samuel and Samuel's just taking his time. Right? He's like a lot of you on Sunday mornings. Our service doesn't start at 10.15, starts at 10. But Samuel's like, hey, I'm going to show up at 10.15. You got biblical qualifications for being late, I guess, right? And he says, I'm going to show up. And as he shows up, Saul had already offered the sacrifices. He did what the, the priest and the prophet was supposed to do as the king. And, and Samuel rebukes him. He says, that, that's not okay. And at that moment, the spirit of God that was on King Saul was removed from the king. No longer was he seen as the king. And then David is anointed, and the spirit of God falls on David as the rightful king of all of Israel. If it was wrong for Saul, if it was wrong for David to take the role of priest, well, then why can Jesus do it? Why is Jesus allowed to do this? Well, he's allowed to do it because Jesus is from a different order. You see, the order of the Levitical priesthood said it wasn't possible. But what does it say about Jesus? It says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You are from a different type, a different order, a different genre of priest. You're from this Melchizedekian priesthood. So the question is, well, what is this Melchizedekian priesthood? Well, Melchizedek was a priest all the way back in Genesis chapter 14. In the story of Abraham, Abraham goes to rescue his nephew Lot. And as he rescues him, he brings him back to the land. And as he brings him back, he encounters this guy named Melchizedek. And, and in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, this is how Melchizedek is described. He was the king of Salem and priest of the Most High God. For keeping track, he's a king and he's a priest. So when it says that Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek, he's saying just as Melchizedek operated as a king priest, Jesus is operating as a king priest. That there was only one other person to do this, and it was Melchizedek. Even more interesting, Melchizedek's name means the king of righteousness. That's what Melchizedek means. So as he shows up in scripture, he is the king of righteousness, and he's ruling over Salem, and Salem meant peace. So he's the king of righteousness and peace. I'll preach a whole sermon on that right there. He's the king of righteousness and peace. And, and he's the king over Salem, which would ultimately be Jerusalem. Melchizedek is a key figure in the Old Testament in helping us understand how Jesus is the king and the priest. And David would have been seeing all of this connection 
as he penned these words in Psalm 110. Because what the king's first responsibility to do as the king of Israel was they were to take the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, and as they took the Torah, they were to create their own copy. They would copy every single word, word for word. And the idea in doing that was that they wanted the king of Israel to know the law of the Lord. And as he wrote those words, he would have written about Melchizedek, this, this odd king priest. And then later in his, his kingship, he would pen these words that Jesus is the king after the order of Melchizedek. He's like, I remember Melchizedek. I wrote about him as I copied the words of the Torah. He's the king priest. And Jesus is this king priest just like Melchizedek was. But it also says that Jesus will hold this position forever. Give verse 4 again. He says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Going back to Melchizedek, when he's described, when he shows up in Genesis, it doesn't say this was Melchizedek's father and his mother and he was from this area or from that area. It, it doesn't say that he had offspring. It just says he was Melchizedek. You say, well, okay, cool. He showed up and that's it. But that was weird in the book of Genesis because everybody that's described in the book of Genesis is like, hey, that's Brandon, son of Eric, son of Dale, son of whoever. And that's what they would say. They would say that these are, this is their lineage. It's a book of lineages. But, but Melchizedek doesn't have any lineage that's tied to him. Very strange in a book like Genesis. It would appear that he has no father, no mother, no beginning and no end. And the New Testament book, Hebrews, confirms this. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3, it says this about Melchizedek. Melchizedek is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. Who's the Son of God? Jesus. He resembles Jesus in that he continues forever as a priest. Hebrews is exclaiming that Jesus is a priest forever, and so is Melchizedek. So why, why is it good that Jesus is a priest in addition to his kingship? I get that, that it's important that he's a king. Kings were powerful. They ruled and they reigned. Why is it important that he's a priest? Well, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 explain this. And all of these scriptures are listed in our, our, uh, our note sheet that we submit in our, our online form. It's online. It's also on our app. But you can also pick one up in the back. All of these scriptures are there. So Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 say this. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need." Jesus, as high priest, understands us, but then he also represents us before God. He advocates for us on our behalf through his sinless life. It says that, that he was without sin, and because he was without sin, he represents and advocates for us. And because he's our priest, we have confidence to draw near in relationship to God. It was Jesus the priest who did that. Not any other Levitical priest. The Levitical priest could not do that. They could offer a temporary solution through the, through the blood sacrifice of an animal, but none of them had a sinless life to offer. But Jesus, as the great high priest, instead of offering a lamb, became the lamb of God and the sinless lamb of God to be in our place and for our sins and to totally atone for all of our sins. Jesus the priest became the sacrifice for us and covered all of our sins. If it wasn't for Jesus, if he wasn't our king, or if he was only our king and he was not our priest, well, then we would still need a way to deal with our sins. If Jesus is just a good king, that's great. He can rule and reign, but there's no way we can have a relationship with him because he's sinless. So the fact that Jesus is the king and the priest means that he creates a way for us to enjoy this relationship with God. Jesus made the way. 
2 Corinthians 5, 21, we looked at it last week. That verse says this. It says, he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus' priesthood is just as important as his kingship. Both of them are equally important. And David shows us in our final point here where both of those roles come together in verses 6 and 7. He says this, Jesus, the king, will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Verses 6 and 7, there's many things about judgment and corpses and death. And I think Danny Aiken summarizes it well. He says this, it's teaching us. These verses are teaching us that Jesus is a powerful advocate as our priest for us but he's also a powerful adversary to all who would oppose him and stand as an enemy towards him. See, if we're not careful, we can miss an even more important thing that Jesus does here. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says he will shatter chiefs. He will shatter chiefs. Maybe in some of your Bibles you have a little number there that, t- that points you to the very bottom of, the, the, of your Bibles that says, or the head. See, the word there is reush. He will shatter the reush. The reush in Hebrew is the head. It says that Jesus will come and he will shatter the head. Now, uh, obviously we could say, well, that, that means that he's going to shatter the heads of nations. And that's true, Jesus will do that. But I think even more so, what we see is that, that I, I, I just can't not, not see the fact that, that it's referring back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that in the garden as Adam and Eve sinned, that God didn't leave them in their sin, but he said, Eve, from your offspring will come one who will shatter the head of the serpent, who will shatter evil itself and sin. The same word used in Genesis 3 is the word that's used to describe Jesus shattering the head in verse 6 of Psalm 110. Jesus is the promised serpent crusher. Jesus is the one who is going to crush the head of sin and Satan. Jesus, the Messiah, will be the king priest who will shatter the head, the head. The heads of the world, but also the head of sin. And that's what he did when he came to this earth. That that act of Jesus crushing the head combines everything about who Jesus is as the king. Remember, he's the one who stands on the neck of his enemies and he destroys them. He makes them his footstool. He, he, he is the, the ruling and reigning king. He does that when he defeats sin. It combines his kingship, but also his priesthood. See, as a priest, it reveals how he's going to defeat sin. It's not that he's just going to kill Satan. No, he's going to defeat the effects of sin in all of our lives for all of our days. This act is combining everything about who he is as the king priest. That's why it's vital for us to understand that Jesus is both our king and our priest. Because he holds both offices, we can be saved. Because Jesus holds both offices, I can stand before you today and say, I know that my eternal destiny is secure because Jesus is my king and he's my priest. That he's ruling and reigning over my life and one day I'll have a perfect relationship with him because he was my priest who went in my place and for my sins. But not only will he shatter Satan's head in verse 6, but in verse 7 it says this, he will drink from the brook by the way, therefore he will lift up his raush. No doubt the words there are play on words. He's going to shatter the head and he will lift up his head. Picture of Jesus destroying Satan in his power, but then also being exalted to the highest position of authority in heaven and on earth. And your homework this week is this. Go home and read Revelation chapter 5. Because when the lamb shows up, and Jesus is the lamb of Revelation chapter 5, when he shows up, he takes his rightful place on the throne over all of the earth. He's ruling and he's reigning. Jesus, the great king and priest, will destroy sin and be exalted over all. So as the worship team comes up, as they close out our time, I want to remind us of this. This lifting of Jesus' head should be encouraging to us. 
that as we read this psalm today in 2024, in a current election cycle that's getting crazier and crazier as the days go on, we would do well to remind ourselves of this passage, that Jesus is the King and the Lord of all. That as much as we will see men lift their heads up and exalt themselves over over nations and over the world, their reign will be short. But there will be a king who will reign forever. There will be a king who will establish his throne forever and ever and ever. And we would do well to remind ourselves that Jesus wins. We would do well to remind ourselves that Jesus is the ultimate authority, the ultimate ruler, the ultimate reigner, the ultimate king. And he will do the most meaningful work. Not lower taxes. Not provide free health care. Not abolish any of these things. Jesus will do the meaningful work of defeating sin. And we would do well to rejoice in this triumphing and victorious king named Jesus today. That he is the one who brings the victory. We would do well to serve and obey him as king. And if you are here today and you've never ever understood that Jesus is your king and he has victory and he's going to win over all of the earth and you want to be on the winning side today, then today is the day that you offer yourself freely to him as your Lord and Savior. Say, Jesus, I can't do it. I need you to do it for me. Jesus, I need need your life to represent mine. I need the righteousness that only you can give as my priest, and then I will follow you for all of my days as my king. The encouragement of this passage is this. Live today like you know the king. Watch the news like you know who the ultimate king is. Live each and every day that you've been given on this earth like you know the king. Let's close our time by praying the psalm together as we've done with all of the psalms. Let's pray this one. Dear Holy Father, as we come before you now, we thank you so much that you are our great king. You're the perfect king. You're not just a good ruler, you're the perfect ruler, the ruler who has all the power of heaven at his fingertips. God, you are the the perfect king of heaven, but also the perfect king of our lives. And we thank you for the reminder in Psalm 110 today. God, I pray that you would help us to live more submissive to who you are as king. God, that you would help our hearts to be more submissive to your commands that we read in scriptures, that we would obey them with our whole being. And God, we pray for those who don't know you. We pray that today, that they would surrender their lives to you today and make you king and offer themselves freely to you. God, we praise you that you're not just our king, but your word tells us that you are also our perfect priest and our sacrifice. God, I confess now today, God, that there there is sin that exists in our world. There's sin that exists in my life and the lives of these people. And God, as our great priest, we can bring that to you and you have paid it in full. You atone for it. If we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins as our perfect high priest. God, I praise you for that. God, I praise you that you promised in the very beginning of the days of our lives, in Genesis chapter 3, that you would crush sin. You would crush the head of the serpent. And God, I thank you for sending Jesus to do exactly that. God, we praise you that we have victory in you, that you are the victorious king and you have full and final victory. Let us worship in light of our victorious king today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Well, once again, it is good to be together uh, as a church family. I just wanted to remind you guys of a few things before we uh, leave this morning. Uh, One, If you have a child that's going into sixth grade or if you're just getting connected to this church and you have uh, a child that is in uh, the youth group age, we do have a parent meeting on August 11th. Um, It's it's going to be from 5.30 to 6.30, so that is before the members meeting. Uh, That way, if you are a member, you can get to both. Um, 
just to remind you again of uh, August 18th, which is our, our church at the Isle. Um, we will be at Beach uh, 11. Uh, we'll be at the pavilion there at 10 a.m. We're going to have an outdoor service, and then we will have beach baptisms following that. If you are interested in getting baptized, uh, please contact the church office. We'd love to talk to you and, and figure that out. Uh, also, uh, if you are interested in leading a C group, uh, or if you are interested in learning more about uh, what goes into leading a C group or, or just C groups in general, um, there is a meeting on August 23rd. It'll be from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, if you are interested in attending that meeting, uh, just please email Sam, uh, Pastor Sam at sam at millcreek.org. Um, it's just, it's better for us if you are SVP. That way we can plan for who's going to be there. Uh, but it was good to be in the house of the Lord today. Uh, let me go ahead and pray us out. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for uh, just your word and the promise that you are our Lord and our Savior and you are the best ruler that we will ever have. Lord, I pray that we would uh, respect you and that we would follow you uh, like the ruler that you are here and now. I pray that we would follow you and uh, follow your commands here and now. And Lord, I pray that uh, when discouraging things in this world do happen, that we would set our eyes on you and we would be reminded of the fact that a better ruler is coming. Lord, we love you uh, and we pray all of this in your name. Amen.